What if I were to pose to you the question, what is the twelfth root of one? Now, most people would dismiss the question as silly, or simply say one and walk away. But honestly, these responses bother me as a mathematician, for there is much more epicness to be found in answering this question completely. Let us suppose that the twelfth root of one, uh, in the example that I gave earlier, is just some number, some, some solution to a polynomial or an equation, something like that. In this case, we can simply say that the twelfth root of one I should have checked these pens first. That the twelfth root of one is equal to x. Let us suppose that it is the uh, first solution to this polynomial which we're forming. And in order to form it, it's actually quite simple. We can we can simply raise both sides of this equation to the power 12 in order to kind of cancel out this this radical. So therefore, 1 equals x to the 12th. And then, quite intuitively, uh, quite intuitively, we can subtract 1 from both sides, and we end up with a polynomial x to the 12th minus 1. And we set that equal to zero. And as I hopefully mentioned before in many of my other videos, uh, when we have a polynomial whose coefficients are all contained in the set of complex numbers, we know that the number of solutions within C is precisely equal to the degree of the polynomial, so in this case, 12. So there are 12 solutions, 12 solutions, in total, to this polynomial, which is extremely interesting, why I love complex numbers so much. It's because, by the fundamental theorem of algebra, there are exactly n solutions. We, we, get, we get an algebraically closed field, and that's very... I mean, it's, frankly, it's just exciting. It's, uh, it's, it's a very wonderful truth. It's, it's really, it's timeless and, and true, uh, for the set of complex numbers. We're calling this, just to be clear, f of x. I just want to be more explicit that, that we're defining a new function here. What I'm thinking is that we need a a kind of process in order to find the other 11 roots to this equation. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who wants to know about that. It's a very interesting kind of problem. It's uh, interesting and uh, exciting in, in and of itself. So in order to do that, we, as I said before, we use complex numbers, and indeed we actually use the unit circle in the complex plane. And as you're hopefully familiar with, that can be related to Euler's formula, which is one of the greatest formulas of all time, e to the i theta equals cosine theta plus i sine theta. But simply put, we are finding the complex number, which is expressible in some way as e to the i theta. So each of these 12 solutions is in some way expressible as e to the i theta for some value of theta, and we're going to find out theta will be between 0 and 2 pi because it's going to be in terms of radians, basically. And in this case, it is it is actually acceptable to limit it from 0 to 2 pi, and we'll get to the reasoning for that later. But whatever solution it is, we know that it's ex expressible as this. So e to the i theta to the 12th power, therefore, minus 1 does equal 0. That's what we're forming. And so therefore e to the i theta, or I should say e to the 12th i theta, equals positive 1. And what is 1 exactly? Well, we've seen in the past that, and you can see my video on this one, 
uh, that each, that, well, that just one by itself, just the number one, is actually expressible as e to the 2i pi. So that's quite fascinating. Well, one way of thinking about it is we can divide both sides by e to the 2i pi, actually, to get this to kind of cancel. And we're, bear in mind, we're trying to kind of solve for theta in this case. Um, and we want to get a set of numbers, if possible. So we're basically getting that e to the 12i theta minus 2i pi equals 1. All right, so with this particular approach to finding the value of theta, it's a little bit complicated because, well, I'm going to continue by asserting that 12i theta minus 2i pi equals, and I'm saying that it can be 0 or 2i pi, or 4i pi, or 6i pi, etc. And this is sort of reminding me of my uh, series on the log of 1, which you may want to see, uh, where I do my best to show that natural logarithm of 1 is not just 0, but it is really uh, an infinite set, because an infinite set of numbers satisfy the conditions where e is raised to the number to get 1. Anyway, basically what we're getting is, no matter which number we choose, I'm, I'm considering this to be, in some sense, equal to a set, which may be poor notation, but I'm trying to convey an idea here. And we basically, since we're trying to find out what theta is, we say 12i theta, and then we can essentially add 2i pi to each of these particular solutions, so we really get... 2i pi, 4i pi, 6i pi, etc. And if you think about it, that's really just the same kind of set of solutions, essentially. Basically, to each of these solutions, I propose that in order to find theta, we simply divide each term by 12i, which is actually a lot simpler than, than you may think. Um, 2i pi divided by 12i is, believe it or not, simply pi over 6. And so, for our purposes, this is actually a very important number, pi over 6. And if we continue this, this is what we get. But the next step is actually to substitute each of these values into Euler's formula. And in that sense, we can generate the 12th roots of 1. So in this case, it actually helps to consider the picture, the basically the diagram of the unit circle in the complex plane and each of the points that I've identified on this circle represent values that are actually complex numbers, and they are indeed solutions to the 12th root of 1. For instance, the most basic of them is equal to now, this is, this is a very special number here, uh, root 3 over 2 plus i over 2. And we call it the primitive 12th root of unity. This is because, in some sense, all of the other solutions to the polynomial are kind of built from this one value. And there are more complicated ways of explaining it. But I will just briefly mention that the structure that is formed by all 12 roots of this 12 degree polynomial, they actually form a special kind of group. And uh, under group theory, you can look up some of the details. So uh, essentially, it forms a cyclic group 
that is closed under multiplication. And the generator of the group is this first element, e to the i pi over 6. I suppose I can make more videos on uh, group theory later on. But this should certainly give you a start for uh, studying roots of unity. So someday I'll probably continue th uh, this video, but just know that there are several different examples of these cyclic groups, particularly those formed under the nth roots of unity. In other words, we could in theory do the same thing for different values of n, like 4th roots of unity or 8th roots of unity, or indeed any natural number n, hence the term nth roots of unity. And so I formulated this table based on values of the complex unit circle, which I mentioned earlier. And in one column, we have a value for theta in radians. It could be measured in some other kind of unit. But just to, to keep it to what you're used to, we'll probably be using radians. And in the central column, we have indeed the actual number that represents e to the i theta. And so this is the number which is graphed in the complex unit circle. And basically, what that means is that each of these numbers, like root 3 over 2 plus i over 2, is represented by simply a point on this complex unit circle. And so, in this final column, I have a, a number, n, for instance, meaning the number such that e to the ni theta equals 1. Really, it's the exponent indicating which root of 1 is expressed by this central number. So I've noted that, uh, as particularly in this particular table, it is even numbers which we're seeing most often. Uh, 12, 8, 6, 4 is how it starts, and then 3, and then we get into these fractional values. And I have a bit of a, uh, an assertion to give regarding these fractional values of n. If any of these n values, which I've calculated, is rational, meaning, um, uh, I say epsilon q, meaning they're members of the field of rational numbers, and if it is, we're, we're presuming it's also not an integer, basically, so it's not a member of the integers, then therefore we have e to the i theta quality to the n equaling e to the i theta to the a over b, and that's what equals 1. So in that case, if we raise both sides to the power b, then we can sort of cancel out that exponent, and we get e to the i theta to the a equals 1 to the b. And 1 to any power we know to be equal to 1, so therefore we can pretty well ignore the denominators of these um, fractional values then. And so that's interesting. Um, if you find a flaw in any of that logic, let me know. But I'm fairly sure it's true. And so we're getting an interesting pattern for these nth roots of unity. In the table itself, I'm using a, a constant difference for uh, theta. Namely, I'm increasing each value of theta by pi over 6 each time. So it kind of makes sense that we get this, this similar pattern. And I'm fairly sure that it is possible, in some way, to determine this number, this, this central number, e to the i theta, if we're given n, I'm fairly sure there's a way to go backwards, in other words. And if we're given, as just a starting point, if we're given n and we get some strange number, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of throw out a, a suggestion here, like an odd prime, like 7 or 11, something, something odd like that, which we're not actually seeing in this right-hand column. It is certainly possible to calculate abstractly 
the end fruit of unity. But I, at least personally, would have a bit of trouble formulating the uh, quote-unquote uh, exact or most precise way of writing that number, like with square roots, as I've done for each of these roots of unity. You see, it it appears as though it's much simpler to use or to calculate this this root of unity knowing that n is 2, 4, 6, 8, etc. But if it's some some odd prime, for instance, 7 or 11, I would certainly have a lot more difficulty with that. Now, maybe that just means I'm less experienced. It probably does. But I think that's the reason that this is going to end up being a multi-part series. Much later in time, if and when I figure out how to uh, calculate, say, like, the seventh root of unity, without just saying cosine of some number plus i sine of some number. In other words, if I can figure out how to write that number with square roots, and without transcendental functions, then at that point I, I hope to post a sequel to this video and go into further depth. But until then, thanks very much for watching, and let me know any questions or comments.